Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. We have a great show for you today. First, the Crumleys get maxed out at their sentencing hearing. The Chad Day Bell trial is going to begin tomorrow morning. Richard Allen's attorneys file more motions, and uh, let's just say they come out swinging. The Apple River case is coming to an end, and Nikolai Mew is testifying today. The jurors in the George Kelly trial get to take a field trip, and hey, if God told you to do it, it wouldn't be illegal, right? Let me give you an example of an aggravated robbery that did not quite go as planned, and then our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Hi, lawyer. 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 Good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is Crime Talk. It is April 9th of 2024. Let's go ahead and get straight to the docket. First, James and Jennifer Crumley have each been sentenced to 15 years in prison, becoming the first parents to ever serve time over a child's school shooting and what is a unique, novel, and some say groundbreaking decision. Now, the parents were convicted at separate trials in February, and juries found them uh, that they callously ignored their son's plea for mental health help while buying him a firearm that he used to massacre four classmates back in 2021. Their uh, sentence will be uh, served. Uh, obviously, they'll get credit for the time served already, which is about two and a half years in custody and they will be barred from contacting uh, their son's victim's family in any way in the future. Now, the sentence was read shortly after victims of Ethan Crumley uh, slammed the parents for a lack of remorse, and they pleaded with the judge to impose the maximum sentence, which the Crumleys ultimately received. Now, don't get me wrong. My heart goes out to each and every one of the family members that are victims of Ethan Crumley's crimes. And uh, Ethan Crumley is pure evil. And this is a test case, a unique legal theory of holding someone responsible for the crimes of another person that they did not know they were going to commit. And when you start convicting people on what they should have done, well, that starts getting into a much lower standard of proof than someone con being convicted of knowingly doing something. It is a legal standard of negligence being reduced to the criminal courts, a standard which is usually used in civil cases. Simply, is it more likely than not that something happened versus not a vague, imaginary, or speculative doubt, but a doubt that would cause people to pause in matters of great importance to themselves. And I've said this before, and some people don't like it, but I will say it again. This is a dangerous precedent. I hope that I'm wrong, but it'll probably be affirmed on appeal because somebody in the appellate courts will say, well, you know, the law's there, the jury did it. We don't want to seem like the bad guys. This was a serious case, but I hope the appellate courts take a look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Like I said, I have no special place in my heart for the Crumleys whatsoever. They're, you know, not great parents. In fact, terrible parents. But beware when being a bad parent becomes a crime. It could come, I don't know, knocking on your own doorstep. Maybe a family member, a friend, perhaps. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. They're basically saying, under this unique novel theory, the parents knew or should have known that something bad was going to happen. Okay? Not that they knew it was going to happen. Like, hey, Ethan, here's your gun. Go off to school. Good boy, right? Even a reasonable standard has to be reasonably foreseeable under a civil law. Like, is it reasonably foreseeable if you don't shovel your walks within the 48 hours that the city gives you to shovel your walks that somebody could slip and fall on those walks that aren't shoveled and they turn to ice? Yes, that reasonably could be. One could say, oh, but they gave him a firearm. It's reasonably foreseeable that he could go and shoot up a school. Well, is it? Has it ever happened before? Has he said, ooh, I'm going to go do this? Not, ooh, here's a couple of drawings from a kid, you know, seeking attention. Don't get me wrong. It's a horrible case, but it's going to make a horrible case on the law. There's, uh, I think it was Mama Pink, one of our mods, sent me a case the other day where a teen driver who had had two accidents, the victims of the second accident were absolutely appalled 
that this kid still had insurance and that his parents were letting him drive after the first accident. Well, my goodness, it's reasonably foreseeable that if your child was involved in one accident, they could be involved in another accident. Oh, guess what? They're actually looking at charging the parents in that particular case. I understand, ladies and gentlemen, it feels good. I get it. You want justice for those four victims of Ethan Crumley. You have to look at the bigger picture sometimes. And yes, it doesn't bring you the relief you want. And those parents are never going to get what they want. They want their children back. And the parents, it may make them feel good, but it accomplishes nothing in the sense of this. Is it going to deter anybody? I don't know. I doubt it. If you're a bad parent, are you going to say, I'm not going to listen to anyone's parenting ideas anyway? I mean, think about it. Here in Colorado, we had the Columbine case. The parents weren't prosecuted for not knowing what was going on in their basement, right? One would say, how could you not know that your child was making explosives and uh, planning the first of many, many of school shootings out there, ladies and gentlemen. Now the parents were shunned, and I guess the, the new word of the day would have been canceled, but the parents weren't charged in the Columbine case because we in the legal system, until now, try not to hold people responsible for conduct that they didn't do or knowingly engage in. I know, bring it on, let me know how I'm wrong, I get it, that's okay. That's just my thoughts on the matter. I wanna hear your thoughts as well, let me know. Next on the docket, Chad Day Bell. That's right, a jury has been selected and opening statements will begin Wednesday morning in regards to the case of Chad Day Bell, who is obviously charged with killing JJ Vallow, uh, Tylee Ryan, and his former wife, Tammy Day Bell. Now, a total of 18 jurors, six alternates, are on the jury pool. The uh, jury pool consists of 10 men and eight women, all from Ada County, a big county, compared to Madison or Fremont County, where the, obviously, uh, incident took place. The jury selection began last Monday and continued through this Monday, where jurors were brought in groups of 16, uh, there to the Ada County Courthouse uh, for the jury selection process. If there were questions as it related to pretrial publicity or some sort of bias as it related to the case, they were questioned on individual voir dire. And obviously they got to the number selected so that they could have enough for the peremptory challenges for each side and still have enough jurors to uh, complete the process. Now, Crime Talk will be streaming the trial live. Join us for gavel to gavel coverage for the uh, case as it relates to Chad Daybell. Now, remember, the jury is death qualified. So that means that the jury, if they find him guilty of one or more of the homicides, then they will have to weigh mitigating and aggravating circumstances and see if the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating circumstances, which could be anything that the defense could put forward in any sort of sentencing phase. And then the jury will ultimately decide if he's convicted, and obviously we'll give him the presumption of innocence, but if he is convicted, then the jury will decide whether Chad Daybell gets the death penalty or life without the possibility of parole. Next, the attorneys for Richard Allen come out swinging again. That's right, the attorney for the accused Delphi killer, Richard Allen, are claiming once again that the police investigators lied or deceived a judge in the filing for a search warrant that led to the arrest of their client. Now, Mr. Allen is accused, obviously, of killing Abby William and Libby German near the Monin High Bridge back in February of 2017, and he faces multiple murder counts of the uh, high-profile case. Now, in the defense team's latest motion, Mr. Allen's attorneys once more called on special judge Francis C. Gull to hold a Franks hearing. That's a determined that is a hearing to determine whether misrepresentations or omissions were in the affidavit. Now, the defense team has made a uh, request uh, that a Franks hearing be held in the past, and, well, the judge has yet to uh, do anything of that. An allegation has been made that there is some sort of 
misrepresentation, lie, or material omission from the affidavit that if you had taken out the lie or put in the truth, that probable cause would not exist. Now, what the defense is calling on is the evidence collected from Richard Allen's home to be thrown out by claiming that the investigators lied to a judge when filing for a search warrant. Now, the court disagreed with the attorneys and no evidence was thrown out. And uh, Gull uh, has uh, called the search reasonable and legal in her previous decisions. Now, both the attorneys for Mr. Allen, Mr. Razi, and Mr. Baldwin made this renewed push for a Franks hearing by once again claiming the police investigators weren't truthful during the early stages of the investigation. Now, the defense team also uh, brought in uh, the uh, prosecutor, Nicholas McClellan, into their allegations by claiming that the prosecutor misled and lied to the defense team as well. In the latest motion, there are accusations already leveled against police and the prosecutors in previous motions. These accusations include accusing the prosecutors of lying about police uh, learning the identity of a Purdue professor when the defense attorney inquired about the search for his identity, along with the claims that investigators misled the judge when filing for a search warrant that led to Mr. Allen's arrest. Now, some examples of the alleged investigators' uh, lies or misdeed include early witnesses supposedly telling police they spotted a man with a muddy and bloody blue jacket. A blue jacket was part of the evidence collected from Mr. Allen's home, but the defense team claims the witness never said bloody when describing the jacket and never said blue, instead saying the man wore a muddy tan jacket. Now, the attorneys accused the police investigators of changing those details when filing for a search warrant, and the defense team also claims an earlier witness described spotting a man as young as 20 years old who had brown poofy hair. The attorneys accuse the investigators of omitting these details when filing for the search warrant to get into Allen's home since the description didn't match up with Mr. Allen. And while the court has not yet weighed in on the defense team's latest attempt to exonerate Mr. Allen by way of throwing out evidence or charges, previously similar attempts have failed to find any uh, inkling of uh, the judge going along with them in any way. So the defense team also recently tried to have Allen's murder charges thrown out over inadvertently deleted interviews uh, from the early part of the investigation. That attempt also failed, and the judge said that the uh, interviews weren't destroyed on purpose and they weren't really material to the case. And all these legal spats over very public battle between Gull and Allen's attorneys that went all the way to the Indiana Supreme Court after Gull threw the pair off of the case for negligence following an evidence leak. Now, the uh, Indiana Supreme Court reinstated uh, both of the attorneys for Mr. Allen, but then Mr. McClellan, the prosecutor, has asked the court to hold Mr. Allen's attorneys in contempt. The judge is still waiting for that request to uh, decide what she's going to do. My guess is it will come the day after the uh, trial is over. Now, that trial is scheduled to begin May 13th and is scheduled to last for several weeks. Next on the docket, the Apple River case. Nikolai Mew, uh, the Apple River stabbing trial, began its second week of testimony this week. And there's new details and new photos about the extent of the victim's injuries. Now, Mew of uh, Prior Lake, Minnesota, stabbed five people on the river in Wisconsin back in July of 2022. 17-year-old Isaac Schumann died in the stabbing and four others were injured and the victims ranged in age from about 17 to 24 and were from Wisconsin to Minnesota. Now the prosecutor has to prove that Mew, who was 54 at the time, was the initial aggressor in this particular incident and Mew's attorneys are arguing that he stabbed the five people in self-defense. Like I said, Mew is charged with first-degree intentional homicide in Schumann's death and attempted first-degree intentional homicide in the stabbing of Riley Matson, A.J. Martin, Dante Carlson, and Tony Carlson. Now, he has pled not guilty to all of those charges, and literally, Nicholas Mew took the stand this morning. I was watching some of it as I was preparing for this story. He was doing okay, seemed a little nervous on the stand. His biggest problem was his prior inconsistent statements to the police when he got arrested and whether he made some, um, let's say, 
wasn't truthful statements to the police about what he did with the knife and why he was there. Rule number one, ladies and gentlemen, if the police want to talk to you, you say, you betcha, I'll be more than happy to talk with you as soon as my attorney gets here. And then the attorney can shut it down and you never have to worry about those prior inconsistent statements. Next on the docket, the George Kelly case. Why did they shut it down? Because apparently they didn't have enough bandwidth in the courthouse or something for the world to view it. So we're getting it on a delay uh, type of situation, but we've been putting up all of the trial as soon as we get it. Well, what is the jury doing today? That's right, the jurors in the George Kelly case are going to the rancher's house to check out the alleged murder scene. They will visit the ranch in his uh, second degree murder trial. Obviously he's accused of shooting and killing a Mexican national who was crossing his property. Now, many of the news people asked to take video of the visit and the judge rejected ranch access, but approved a compromise which allowed the video related to the ranch visit. The judge uh, ruled it would be too hard to be sure that the jurors wouldn't be shown. Apparently that's forbidden under Arizona law and it was seen as a threat to the juror's safety. So the judge says he recognizes the high interest in the case and has allowed camera access as long as it does not show jurors. So in this case, he'll allow video of the jurors uh, leaving in the van from the courthouse and then uh, returning as well. So the news media argued to the court that there's been a lot of testimony about what Mr. Kelly could see and hear from his house. And there was a lot of testimony about the distance from the house from where the body was found. There was even testimony about how his horse behaved as people crossed Mr. Kelly's ranch, where Mr. Kelly fired nine shots from his rifle. Now the attorneys for both the prosecution and the defense said, hey, let's go check this out. And um, we'll see, I think it's gonna be a big factor. Um, like I said, the, the court, they make it sound like it's a great distance away. The prosecutors have made it sound like it is a great distance away, some 100 feet. Hard to show that you were in immediate danger, but it's dark, it's, it's late. Uh, unknown people who you believe are armed coming across your property. I think a reasonable argument can be made. Mr. Kelly and his wife were in danger and they defended themselves. Also an argument can be made that there was no imminent immediate danger and therefore it was unreasonable to uh, shoot anybody. It's really gonna depend on what the jurors uh, think in this particular case. It really could go either way. I know a lot of people uh, have left comments on this case saying guilty, other people saying innocent. It could go either way. We're going to have to wait and see. Um, hopefully the court will allow us to uh, get enough bandwidth uh, to them so that we can um, uh, see the closing arguments because I think it'll be a really good one. Next, so if God told you to do it, it must be legal, right? Well, um, meet Talon Celestine. She was stopped by police on I-10 on Monday after reports of an active shooter um, just outside of Tallahassee, Florida. Now, Celestine drove a purple Dodge Challenger with Georgia plates onto the highway and within five miles, she fired multiple shots into another vehicle before hitting another driver. Now, one of the drivers was hit with glass from his car window and was grazed in the arm by the bullet. The other was struck in the neck and was taken to the hospital. Now, once they located Miss Celestine, pulled her over at a traffic stop and uh, took her into custody, they found that she had a rifle and a handgun in her car. Uh, before she uh, apparently went on this little rampage, she told people that she was gonna go on a shooting spree because God instructed her to do it because of the eclipse. Yeah. So anyway, I expect a mental health evaluation forthcoming in that one. Anyway, she has been charged with attempted murder, aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, and improper discharge of a firearm, and a failure to use your turn signal. Okay, I'm just joking about the failure to use your turn signal, but you get the drift. They're going to pile it on, as well they should. Anyway, um, if she is convicted of first degree attempted murder, that carries a life sentence in jail, with a possibility for parole and a $10,000 fine. And the other charges uh, carry up to 15 years of parole and 15 years in prison and a fine of up to $10,000. I guess if God tells you to do it, 
It doesn't make it legal, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe God will be co-counsel at her trial. I've had God as co-counsel several times when clients have said it's all it's in God's hands. Unfortunately, God has never come through as a good co-counsel. Good luck, Miss Celestine. Next on the docket, well, this little aggravated robbery didn't quite work out as planned. So a gas station robbery back in January that ended with a bystander, a good Samaritan, shooting and killing the robber was apparently a fake scheme between the robber and the victims who were trying to get temporary immigration status. Now, um, 22-year-old Rashid Scott had coordinated the fake robbery with another man by the name of William Winfrey. Now, police later found uh, messages between the two men, and the idea was uh, Scott would pretend to rob two victims who would then file for the U visa status. Now, on January 27th, like I said, Scott pretended to rob two people in the uh, Swift gas station, and that's when a bystander by the name of Jesus Vargas allegedly shot and killed Mr. Scott, believing that he was robbing someone at gunpoint. Now, the uh, court documents say that Mr. Vargas told police he fled uh, after shooting Mr. Scott because he was violating his parole and he shouldn't have been in possession of a gun. Well, isn't your first thought? Well, that could never have happened because if you're a convicted felon, you can't possess a firearm, right? Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. Anyway, now one of the two victims who was involved in uh, the scheme uh, denied that uh, the crime had been staged, but he did admit that, uh, hey, I did apply for that U visa status about three or four months later. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. Um, no indication of whether Mr. Vargas is going to be charged, not probably for the shooting, but probably for that felon in possession of a firearm, which would obviously be in violation of his parole. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. Next on the docket, our dumb criminal of the day. Please meet Mr. James Weeks. Now, he took the position with the police officers that he is not subject to an arrest and that he should be allowed to be drunk and disorderly and sit in a trash can naked. It's a bold, bold uh, position. I'm not going to go uh, against uh, Mr. Weeks, but it's a bold position one that the St. Petersburg's Police Department did not agree with Mr. Weeks' analysis of the law. And instead of letting him stay there, uh, he was arrested. The police found that he was intoxicated, unsteady on his feet, smelled of booze, oh, and he was naked. So when Mr. Weeks was removed uh, naked from the trash can, and arrested, he also picked up a resisting charge as well. Now, in addition to claiming that he could not be punished, he did not uh, have to provide officers with his name or relevant demographics. But Mr. Weeks, uh, while sitting in custody, decided that he was going to plead guilty to both counts and was released and ordered to pay a $500 fine. Now, apparently this isn't Mr. Weeks' first little foray into nakedness on streets. One of his prior busts came after Mr. Weeks and a friend of his were spotted drunk and naked on a Tampa street after they exited the bar. And the uh, two men told the police that they thought it'd be fun to strip off all of their clothes. At least there was no trash can. So I guess that's not really 404B evidence in the next trial because there's no trash can. It's not so similarly related. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have for you today. Thanks for joining us. Remember, please join us live tonight, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, as well as 
for our Patreon show immediately following our live program. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.